And Jasmine, um, that's on again. Can you give me access one more time? Yes, I saw where it put you in the waiting room for a moment. Not sure what happened there. All right, you should have just received it. Got it. Right. All right. So first, I would like to thank everyone that's here with us today. We appreciate you joining. Uh, we have some great information from you from the um from someone from the actual SBA office today. And I am going to, if you don't mind, wanted to go a little bit over your bio here so they can understand what type of professional we have with us today. And so, um, and please correct me, is it Ahmad Gori? That's correct, right on, you right on target. <laughs> Great. So we have with us today, Mr. Ahmad Gori, who joined the U.S. Small Business Administration in June of 2010 and currently is the lead, um, lead economic development specialist in the Dallas-Fort Worth District Office. As the lead economic development specialist, Ahmad serves as chief of the marketing and outreach division, where he leads a team of specialists that work on building and maintaining collaborative partnerships with small business stakeholders, such as economic development um, practitioners, chambers of commerce, business associations, educational institutions, and civic and community organizations. In January of 2013, SBA also named uh, Mr. Ahmad as their public information officer for the Dallas-Fort Worth District. And as the PIO, Ahmad is the official spokesperson for the district and works closely with the media outlets on promoting SBA programs and services throughout 72 counties. Um, Ahmad's outreach has helped generate over $6.7 billion to small businesses in creating over 50,000 jobs in the DFW area. Let me give you that through SBA's traditional programs. During the COVID-19 pandemic, Ahmad worked hard to provide outreach and assistance to DFW area business communities on the Paycheck Protection Program and Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, which helped over 100,000 businesses get more than $6 billion to recover. Prior to SBA, Ahmad worked as a senior legislative aide for business and commerce in the office of State Senator Royce West where he was responsible for working with Texas state agencies in meeting their hub goals and increasing expenditures with African-American owned firms in the program. Additionally, while working for the Senator, Ahmad worked on legislation that created the second building at the University of North Texas at Dallas and helped pass the bill that instituted the UNT Dallas College of Law. Ahmad was featured as a Fox 4 News hometown hero and received letters for his community engagement from former President Barack Obama and Dallas County Judge Clay Jenkins. Ahmad was born and raised in Dallas where he attended H. Grady Spruce High School. He graduated from Jarvis Christian College with a degree in history and is a member of Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated. Ahmad earned his master's in political science from the Dallas Baptist University he is currently a PhD candidate in urban planning and public policy at the University of Texas at Arlington. So um, without further ado, I want to say again that we appreciate you, Mr. Amaya, for sharing your time with us as well as your expertise today. Um, just to give, a, before we jump into the presentation, um, I do want to tell you all a little bit about the organization. So our organization, so one, my name is Jasmine Anderson and I'm the operations manager of the Zan Wesley Homes Community Outreach Center. And we do several things, but for the sake of time today, I'll focus on the lunch and learns that we've developed with our um, executive director, who is Frances Smithine, who unfortunately was unable to join us today. So she did send her apologies, but she is actually working with another group of ours um, for masterminds, um, which is a masterminds group that we're creating um, to create millionaires. So. And unfortunately, this is that was planned way before we had got this on the books. So she wanted to make sure that she still did honor her word with those interviews with those participants. 
Um, but what we do, we have Lunch and Learn. So we host di several different topics, but most of our topics are geared and centered around our mission, which is creating sustainable pathways out of poverty. So we work a lot with different small businesses as well as individuals looking to own or grow small businesses. So that way that they can scale forward in the hopes and the idea that not only their revenue will grow, but they'll also be able to employ others. So that way we'll be able to alleviate that unemployment, especially inside of our community um, in those target areas that need the most help. So um, today we have with us, like I said, Mr. Um, Ahmad Ghori from the SBA's office. Our next um, presentation will be on the fourth and that's gonna actually be towards low vision. So that's gonna be a conversation of what is low vision, but it's also gonna be an opportunity to put you in front of the people that can, um, for those that may have been affected by COVID, if you need to get your eyes checked, um, get those eye exams, or if you even need free prescription glasses, um, they're allowing and providing that opportunity um, because they got some grant money through COVID for that as well. So we would love for you all to join us on the 4th as well. And then of course, always um, send us your email so we can get you on our email list so you can learn about other opportunities that we have um, when it comes to either the SBA or if you can come from other financial institutions. Um, but without further ado, I will now give the floor over to Mr. Gurry. Thank you again for having us. Thank you, Jasmine. Thank you for that introduction. And thank you to Francis and you for allowing me to uh, be able to share this important information uh, to all of those individuals out there who are business owners or even thinking about becoming business owners. Uh, this is some really important information <coughs> that I have to share. Uh, just to give you a little background of what we are and who we are. Uh, we are the US Small Business Administration and the SBA is a federal agency. And when I say that, that means that all of our programs are dedicated towards the public. So we are funded by Congress who's in turn funded by your tax dollars. The head of our agency is the administrator of SBA who is appointed by the president of the United States and confirmed by the US Senate and ultimately serves on the president's cabinet. The last three presidents, President Biden, President Trump, and President Obama, all three elevated the SBA to a cabinet level agency. So it just goes to show you how important small businesses are to our US economy. So I represent the Dallas-Fort Worth District Office of SBA, and there are 68 offices across the country like my office uh, that are in just about every state, every major city. Uh, my office, we rank typically about number four out of those 68 when it comes to giving loans to small businesses. So we have a pretty progressive team, and most importantly, we have a pretty good network of partners like Design the Homes Community uh, Initiative uh, to get the word out about our programs and services to make sure that those businesses owners and those that are interested in becoming business owners have the SBA tools and resources to make that happen. So what I'm going to talk to you today about is something specific about businesses who uh, have experienced issues due to COVID, and that is the Paycheck Protection Program and what this program means. This program was designed by Congress uh, when uh, COVID first uh, hit the United States in places were starting to shut down. And as a result, as we saw places shut down, businesses were highly affected. And not just because businesses were, uh, places were shutting down, but people uh, had a fear and still have a fear with going out and shopping and utilizing our small businesses. So as a result, Congress came up with a economic relief plan back in early of last year. And part of that plan there were funds set aside for the creation of the Paycheck Protection Program or PPP to help small businesses with their payroll. So the main portion of it was to help either keep employees on payroll or if businesses had to lay their employees off due to COVID, bring them back on payroll immediately. But what's really great about this program is it's a loan program, but if you use it for the purposes that it was designed, then you could get that loan completely forgiven which is ultimately treated just like a grant. So I'm gonna go through that and what it means. Uh, first, I'm gonna talk to you about where we are with this program. How can you take advantage of it for the first time? Uh, how can you take advantage of it for a second time if you've done it before? Uh, how can you get it forgiven? And most importantly, what can you do to access this program and what resources are out there to help you navigate uh, with applying for this program? So as I stated, uh, this program was created by Congress. Uh, with this new round of funding that was passed uh, about a month ago, 
we are targeting certain segments of the country, which are those hardest hit small businesses that include women businesses, minority businesses, and veteran businesses. And what we have done as an SBA is we initially open up PPP loan applications solely for those businesses and for small institutions. So what we saw when we when this program first launched early last year is that a lot of the large banking institutions kind of overwhelmed the process. And a lot of the smaller institutions really didn't get a chance to serve their uh, customers. So we opened it up this go round to some of the small community financial institutions, which have those specialized missions to serve underserved communities. Uh, we also leverage our, what we have a lender match tool on our website. So we saw that a lot of business owners, uh, just because they had an app on their phone, uh, with a banking institution or they had a bank account with a banking institution, they didn't necessarily have a relationship uh, with that banking institution and therefore uh, kind of got left behind when it came to accessing uh, some of these funds. So we've leveraged a tool on our website that matches a business owner up with a banking institution so they could get access to these funds. And then lastly, we're continually providing training materials and assistance via the SBA field offices that I named 68 of those across the country. And again, right here in the DFW area uh, where we have the Dallas-Fort Worth SBA district office. And then we have resource partners uh, that we fund directly to in turn offer you business counseling to help you with any issue that you have with business. Here locally, we have something called small business development centers. They're typically located at colleges. Uh, we also have SCORE chapters. Uh, they are volunteers they come back and share their expertise with individuals who are looking to start a business or grow a business, and they do it all at no cost. We also have a women's business center, which caters towards our women entrepreneurs, and we have a veterans business outreach center, which obviously is there to help with our veteran business owners. So here we are, the key dates of the Paycheck Protection Program. On January 11th, we opened up this program again, and we opened it up for only, the, for only those businesses that are looking to access it for the first time to get a first draw loan. Uh, and we opened it up only from those small institutions, lending institutions called community financial institutions. Uh, here in the DFW area, we have three that serve this area. Uh, they are called People Fund, Live Fund, and BC out of Texas. So these three institutions institutions are small community-based nonprofit institutions that specialize in lending to underserved markets like minority business owners. So on January 11th, we only opened up the Paycheck Protection Program for businesses that are looking to access it for the first time only through those type of banking institutions. On January 13th, we open up the Paycheck Protection Program for those businesses that are looking to access the program for a second time uh, through a second draw from those same type of institutions. On January 15th, we open up PPP loans for first draw and second draw applications to lending institutions with 1 billion or less in assets, uh, which are like credit unions. Well, we open it up for those businesses to apply through institutions like credit unions so that they can get access to the program first. And last week on January 19th, we opened up the Paycheck Protection Program for first draw and second draw applications to all participating lending institutions, including your large banks like your Bank of America's, your Wells Fargo's, and your BBA conferences, et cetera. And then the, March 31st is the deadline to apply for this forgivable loan program called the Paycheck Protection Program. So a first draw loan is for eligible applicants that received a PPP loan prior to August the 9th. Uh, PPP loan eligibility now includes additional type of entities. Uh, we, we expanded what type of businesses can apply. Uh, the covered expenses are expanded. So you're able to get more things forgiven of what you decide to use the funds for than what you could use them for before. Uh, you're able to select the period of where you want your cover period. So um, when the program first rolled out, you had eight weeks to spend the money and that was called your covered period. When it rolled out the second time, you had up to 24 weeks as your covered period. Now you get to choose anywhere between eight and 24 weeks on how you wanna spend the money and that's considered your covered period. And then on March 31st is the deadline again. So new entities that can apply for this program are housing cooperatives, 
which are like apartment complexes, destination marketing organizations, which are like visitors bureaus, uh, chambers of commerce, uh, which are 501c6 organizations, and businesses that are still able to apply, that were able to apply before and can do so again starting of last week uh, are partnerships, corporations, and LLCs. But what I really want to focus on that a lot of people really were misunderstood about Jasmine is if sole proprietors, independent contractors, and self-employed individuals could take advantage of the program. They could have before and they still can today apply for this program. So sole proprietors, independent contractors, those are like your Uber drivers, your Lyft drivers, your barbers, your beauticians, your musicians, your photographers. Uh, if you're operating that home-based business, all of those type of entities apply can apply for this particular program uh, as of today. Any nonprofits uh, that are out there, including faith-based institutions like houses of worship and churches, can take advantage of this program as well. 501c19 veteran organizations and tribal businesses uh, too. So if you were able to access the program before, uh, you can possibly get a second dab at the program. And that's called a second draw PPP loan. And this is for borrowers, again, that received a PPP loan uh, prior. Uh, they have less than 300 employees and have suffered a 25% reduction in gross receipts. For borrowers, the maximum loan amount that you can receive for a second draw PPP loan is 2.5 times your average monthly 2019 or 2020 payroll costs, up to $2 million. Uh, if you are a borrower in the accommodation and food services sector, like your restaurant industry, the maximum loan amount for a second draw PPP loan is 3.5 times average monthly payroll of 2019 or 2020, up to $2 million as well. And if you're looking to access the Paycheck Protection Program for a second time, you must fill out the form 2483SD and submit it to a lending institution. Rather you are looking to access it for a first time or a second time, you have to apply through a bank. You do not apply directly through SBA. You apply through a banking institution, a lender. So the second draw, uh, PPP eligibility, you must have received a Paycheck Protection Program prior to and you must have used all of those funds before we can disperse you a second draw loan. You must not have no more than 300 employees and you must demonstrate a 25% reduction in gross receipts between a comparable quarter in 2019 and that same quarter in 2020. So if you're looking to access this program again, you must show that you had a 25% reduction in either quarter number two, quarter number three, or quarter number four in 2019 compared to that same quarter in 2020. So this is what I really want businesses to be aware of is you could get this loan and if you use the loan for the purposes that it was designed for, then you could get that loan completely forgiven. So borrowers must apply for forgiveness through their banking institution and that banking institution submits the forgiveness application to SBA. So at the end of your covered period, that eight or 24 weeks or between eight and 24 weeks, you have 10 months to apply for forgiveness to get that loan forgiveness. Uh, if you don't apply within that 10 months, you have to pay it back and you have to start making payments on that loan immediately. Uh, once you do that, once you submit the uh, forgiveness application within 10 months to the bank, the banking institution sends it to SBA within 60 days. And then SBA has 90 days to review it and make a decision on if you want it for, if they want to forgive it. So in order to get the loan forgiven, you must use at least 60% on payroll costs. Hence the name, the Paycheck Protection Program. So the sole purpose of the program is to make sure that businesses are able to keep employees on payroll. So if you must, you must use at least 60% on payroll. You could use all 100% on payroll if you want, but you must use at least 60% on payroll if you want it forgiven. You also have the ability to use not more than 40% on your operating costs. And we'll talk more about what operating costs mean. Prior to this new round, if you got an economic injury disaster loan advance that up to $10,000 grant, that was deducted from your forgiveness. That's no longer deducted. Uh, forgivable, uh, PP, forgiving PPP loans are not taxable income. So any expenses that are paid with PPP loan funds are now tax deductible. 
and you can consult with IRS about details related to that. And the forgivable expenses that I just mentioned, mentioned are expanded. So you're able to get not more than 40% of things like your rent, for instance, for your business. Uh, we realize that even though things may be shut down and people are not utilizing businesses like they used to due to COVID, uh, those businesses are still responsible for their operating costs, such as their rent. So your rent is a forgivable expense if you decide to use these funds for that purpose. You just can't use not more than 40% of the funds for that purpose. Also, things like your utilities, your electric bill, your telephone, your internet access, your transportation costs, all of that is forgivable expenses, not more than 40% as well. And then new to this is things such as purchasing personal protective equipment, PPE for yourself and your staff. That is a forgivable expense. If you had to fortify your business, like putting up shields within your restaurant or your business to fight against COVID, that's a forgivable expense. If your business was damaged during the 2020 riots, that is a forgivable expense as well to help rebuild your business. We're also making it easier for businesses that apply for this loan program and that are going to apply and are looking to get it forgiven for loans under 150,000. We're making that process easy for you to get that forgiven if you got that small loan. So far, uh, since the opening of the program on January 11th, the relaunch of the program on January 11th, we've approved over 400,000 loans nationally worth about $35 billion. Mind you, Congress, when they passed this new round of funding back in December, they allocated $284 billion for this program. So, so far we've used 35 billion of that 284 billion uh, for businesses uh, that were affected by COVID that are looking to access the program for the first time or the second time. So here's another program called the SBA Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program or IDLE. Uh, this is a loan program uh, we look at a six month injury period for loans up to 150,000. Uh, it has a set low interest rate and the interest rate is 3.75% for for-profits and 2.75% for non-profits over a 30 year period. Uh, the application deadline was extended to January 31st of 2021. And you apply directly through SBA's website for this particular program at sba.gov. We're also gonna be issuing grants again for this program, but they're gonna be targeted grants. They're only gonna be for those businesses that applied for the IDLE loan before and either didn't get the full 10K or they applied for the program and funds ran out. But they also must be located in low income areas and suffered a 30% or more economic loss. Uh, there's nothing that you will have to do to access this. Uh, SBA is going to notify those businesses who applied before and didn't get the full grant or funds ran out. So you would not have to reapply. We're going to notify you uh, since you've already applied and you didn't get access to the funds or all of the funds before. Uh, this information is being updated on our website, sba.gov. So what can you do now as a business owner and you wanna access this program? So for the Paycheck Protection Program, if you're looking to access it for the first time, the best thing to do is to contact your lender. If you're looking to access it for a second time, you can contact the same lender that you used before, or you could use a new lender if you desire. Uh, if you don't have a lender, you can go to our website, sba.gov forward slash lender match, and we will match you up with a lender. And Jasmine, at the end of this, I will send you a list of banking institutions here in the DFW area that have committed to opening up this program to new customers uh, that don't have relationships with them already. Uh, this information is a lot to digest. Uh, the information is constantly changing. You could get the latest information about this program on sba.gov forward slash PPP. And additional resources, our office is always a great resource if you have questions. That's the contact information there, the phone number and email address. You could call or email us and we'll definitely make sure we try to answer your question if you have any related to this program. Early in the pre presentation, I mentioned that we have resource partners that we fund here locally, such as the Small Business Development Center, SCORE, Women's Business Center and Veterans Business Outreach Center. 
they are able to walk you through these uh, application processes or help you with anything or concerns that you have with business all at no cost they're your own professional business advisors uh, uh, counselors uh, there to help you uh, with anything that you have with issues either starting or growing a business or navigating through all these processes I encourage everyone to sign up for our email updates where we're constantly emailing uh, any updates about any of our programs and what you can do as a prospective business owner to access them and what you can do as a business owner to take advantage of them. Uh, you can also follow our local Twitter account if you have Twitter at SBA DFW. We're posting live information on how these programs are changing and anything that's, that's new that comes out. Uh, another new program that we have that's coming out in the next couple of weeks is called our Shuttered Venues Grant. And this is a grant specifically for live venues or entertainment uh, businesses that were affected by COVID. So we're gonna be giving out either 45% of your gross receipts or up to $10 million, whichever is less for those type of businesses that are in the entertainment industry that were affected by COVID. And when I say entertainment industry, we are considering those are like theaters, uh, museums, live venues, uh, any promoters that book live artists or concerts, things like that uh, are considered uh, uh, live venues or shuttered venues uh, during this particular period. And with that, Jasmine, I will turn it back over to you and be more than happy to take any questions. All right, I'm coming back here. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, great. So thank you. That was some great information. I know mean, I was over here jotting down notes while I was trying to keep some information in as well. Um, so I guess now we will open up the floor for questions. How we'll do this though, is I ask that you please raise your hand if you don't mind. And then um, I'll call your names out and I'll just try to go in order the best that I can. If you see that I keep missing over you, just, um, just put it down in the chat, maybe your question or even your name. But um, if you want to unmute yourself, if you don't want or if you're not comfortable with unmuting yourself, then just put your question in the chat and we'll try to get to those as well. And I'll read those off to you. All right. So if anyone wanted to ask anything, you can go ahead and raise your hand. And I, I just dawned on me that some people may not even know how to raise your hand. So if you don't know how to raise your hand, just put your question in the chat for me. All right, uh, Ms. Ford, you have the floor. Yes, ma'am. Can you hear me? <clears throat> okay, I just wanted to make sure I had to walk outside. Okay, uh, I had, I have an existing business and I had applied for, uh, all, you know, everything that, that was being offered at first and I was denied. And um, when I got denied, they told me to submit a reconsideration and I did that. And then they were asking me to submit um, some kind of tax form. But I'm a sole proprietor and I, I think the people that I listed, um, I kind of paid them in cash. So I didn't have the tax forms that they were asking for. So I'm trying to figure out, like, I, I didn't get approved for it. I didn't get the loan. I didn't get the grant. What can I do to, um, I guess, get what get whatever's being offered, if that makes sense? Yeah. So it sounds like you apply for the economic injury disaster loan, the idle loan. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And I think I was just so kind of, I was, it was overwhelming and I didn't really know if I put the correct information so I think it was like an error on my part so then I think I tried to submit another one and then they kicked that one out saying they were going to process the original one so I'm just trying to see what I can do to kind of get some assistance yeah so right so with the economic injury disaster loan if you were denied uh in that denial letter, it tells you how to submit a reconsideration. So you wouldn't go back on the website and apply again, because yeah, it could uh, cause a conflict and cause duplicate applications and uh, really cause a challenge with getting the loan process, even if you're trying to go through reconsideration. Uh, so it seems like they asked for some additional documentation from you. And that's, yes, what, that's what they're gonna ask for with the reconsideration. They're gonna ask for your 2019 tax returns. They're also going to ask for an IRS form 4506T, which is a request for transcripts from the IRS from, for, for your business. 
in a yes, statement sir. on um, why you need the loan. So it sounds like you need to talk with a business advisor and the Dallas Metropolitan SBDC uh, is a place where you could get assistance, uh, where they could help you get your documentation together and hopefully uh, get you uh, going with this particular program. Also, if you're interested in the Paycheck Protection Program, uh, definitely reach out to a banking institution. Um, and there's three institutions here in the Metroplex that are small institutions. They are People Fund, Lift Fund, and BCL of Texas. And I'll put all this information in the chat for you to see it. All right, and now we're going to go ahead and go to Mr. Tommy. All right, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you good. Okay. Yeah, the question I have is that in completing the uh, or applying for the PPP loan, uh, you go to your the line 31 uh, to help determine the amount that you qualify for. Uh, my question is, if that's a negative number, are you still able to process through? Negative meaning that you know your deductions were such that. Um, you know, it, it created a, a credit. Yeah, you brought up a great point, uh, Tommy. Uh, so yeah, for sole proprietors, those that are that have a Schedule C, if you go to line 31 and you have a negative or a zero, then you would not qualify for the Paycheck Protection Program. Definitely consider the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program as an, uh, uh, an alternative option. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I actually, I knew someone else that had that same question during that during the first draw. So I'm happy that you provided us some clarity on that. So we do have some questions here in the chat. So we'll go here in order. So the first question is, I heard that if we were denied for an EIDL loan, would we be eligible to receive the grant? I'm assuming they were referring to that advance. Um, and they want to know, is that correct? And also, um, and they have another, oh no, that's another person. My apologies. So that's the end of that question. So the economic injury disaster loan advances or grant. So that's going to be rolled out again, but it's going to be target based. It's going to be those for those businesses that applied for the economic injury disaster loan program that either didn't get the full 10K or funds ran out and they didn't get anything as well as they're gonna have to show that they are in a low income area deemed by SBA. And we're gonna have an interactive tool on our website that's gonna determine that where you can enter your address. And then secondly, they must show a 30% reduction in gross receipts. And there's nothing that, that the borrower will have to do to access that. SBA is gonna initiate those uh, correspondences directly to those individuals that apply and either didn't get the full 10K or uh, the funds ran out and they di didn't get anything. So you wouldn't reapply. SBA is going to reinitiate that on their own from the system, from the database that we have where people already applied. Yeah, and I actually have a follow up question on that. So, what about those that are already inside the reconsideration process? So, um, obviously, the money was already kind of dried out by the time that they went through the reconsideration process. So, they didn't get the advances either. Will those people be, will those people have an opportunity at the new advances or new grant money? Or is there any something different that they may have to do? Yeah, so we're not sure yet. This program is still being designed. Uh, and, uh, how it's going to play out. So that information I haven't heard of as of yet. Uh, hopefully we should be getting some new guidance in the next couple of weeks of the details on uh, how it's going to roll out and how it may affect those uh, ind individual businesses that are uh, in reconsideration. Thank you. All right, so we have our next question here is from Sandra. And I believe she may want to, um, she has a question about a startup or a new business. So Sandra, you now have the floor if you wanted to unmute yourself. Yes, thank you. Uh, Mr. Bury, uh, here's my dilemma. Uh, I originally had a training providing company where basically my consultations were face-to-face. -face. Uh, I had an office downtown Dallas. Uh, I purchased that office, uh, leased that office in October. And by the time I got it set up and had all of my equipment in, COVID hit. And so therefore, because of the riots and COVID, uh, the building, the property lender basically kind of shut down, my business shut down. 
So now I'm trying to build a platform with a different vision uh, that focuses on remote uh, uh, clientele. So because it'll be a new business, it seems that the PPP and the EIDL is for existing businesses that have some type of revenue to show versus someone who has a forecast for a brand new business that needs startup costs. So what do you have available for us? Yeah, so our traditional programs are still in existence and we have our 7A loan program, which are loans up to 5 million. Uh, the SBA guarantee. We have our 504 uh, loan program, uh, which is an economic development program. And we have our micro loan program, uh, which are small loans up to 50,000 that you can use as startup funds. And I posted in the chat of three micro lenders and they are BCL of Texas, People Fund and Live Fund. They are the ones that can provide that up to 50,000 startup funds for a business that's looking to get started. Uh, but yeah, you're right. Uh, for the Paycheck Protection Program, the business had to be in operation prior to February of 2020. And then for the Economic Injury Disaster Loan, January of 2020, uh, they had to be in, in existence. Uh, but again, those traditional programs are still there that you can access uh, to starting a business. My suggestion is you work with one of our business counselors. I just posted again the link. Uh, to the Small Business Development Center and work with a business advisor that can assess your business uh, uh, plan and what you're trying to do with starting this business and direct you to a funding institution that may be uh, better suitable uh, for your type of business and may have an appetite for your business. Uh, what we're seeing now is that it's a really difficult time to try to start a business, but a really good time to plan for starting a business. Uh, a lot of banking institutions, for instance, right now are just just don't have the appetite to lend uh, traditional funding to restaurants, for instance. Uh, but there are banking institutions that do have so certain appetites during this time. And those business advisors at that link that I just provided, the Dallas Metropolitan Small Business Development Center, they can work with you at no cost, be your own business consultant and direct you with what you need to do to get that business up and running. Now, when you say they don't have an appetite, are you talking about when they run a credit check and there's a certain score they're looking for? Uh, are they looking for previous experience in other businesses? Uh, what was the su success rate of debt? What are they actually looking for? Give me an example. Yeah, so when I say a bank doesn't have an appetite for something, that means they're just not interested in lending to that, uh, to that uh, particular industry. So like right now, a lot of business, a lot of banking institutions are just not interested in providing any type of traditional funding to restaurants, simply because restaurants are basically the hardest hit industry, one of the hardest hit industries during this whole COVID pandemic. Uh, so yeah, that's what I mean by appetite. That means basically they're just not interested in lending to certain industries of business. But that doesn't go to show, to say that uh, all banking institutions are feeling that way. There are banking institutions that are still lending in many areas of industries, uh, but it's really good for you to uh, work with a business advisor at that link that I just provided and let them uh, try to figure out what institutions out there are interested in whatever industry uh, you're looking to go into. And, and one last question, and I'll give somebody else a chance. Uh, in terms of, because I am a training provider and I see the need for the gap in education right now with so many kids being dropped out, um, as a nonprofit, would that be more conducive to what a, a bank would have an appetite for? Okay, so... So those traditional programs that I mentioned with SBA, uh, unfortunately, they are not for nonprofits. They are for for-profits. Okay. But again, work with that business advisor uh, uh, and um, see what they have, what, what other options are out there for you. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. And Ms. Sandra, um, if you don't mind, if you could put your email in the chat for us. Uh, we also have a um, business advisor, I believe, that actually works um, hand in hand with one of the organizations that you were saying, Mr. Ahmad, Ms. Judith Phillips, um, and she does a lot of great work. So we can definitely uh, refer you to her um, as well as if you need any assistance with getting your paperwork together and things of that nature. Um, our organization does assist with that. And a lot of those um, CF, um, the CDFIs, I believe is what they're called, uh, which are those lending institutions he was referring to. Uh, we have had a presentation with them in the past. I believe those were reported. 
um it's called like grow your money or something like that so you can look through some of our old videos on our facebook and i believe you may see a couple of videos there where they speak more in depth about because this was prior to ppp so they speak more in depth about those traditional lending um sources and opportunities and um how and what and what you'll need what the template is um what type of paperwork they're looking for what how do you qualify and what do you need to qualify so you may be able to find that on our Facebook page as well. Oh, All right, awesome. So, awesome. Thank you. So we're going to move here to the next one. All right, we have George, and he says um, he wanted to first say thank you, um, Mr. Ahmad. And um, they have a question about opportunities available for startups and new business, which I know you kind of already spoke on. Um, he wanted to know, um, I guess, more specifically, are there any grant opportunities that are available, I guess, through the SBA office? Yeah, so the only thing that we have that's kind of considered a grant is for those businesses that have been affected by COVID-19, uh, which is basically the Paycheck Protection Program. It's not a grant, it's a forgivable loan uh, program. So that's the really the only thing that we have that's open right now. And again, uh, hopefully soon those advances, idle advances or grants will open back up, but it will only be open up to those targeted small businesses that applied before. And also, um, as he was saying, um, we do now, of course, we understand that you all need your funding now. We do have a grant writing class that will be coming up towards the end of this quarter. So I want to say probably like around May or somewhere around there um, for those that may be interested in how to write a grant, um, how to find grants, source grants, um, and how to figure out how to actually get those grants. Um, most nonprofits are the ones that benefit from grants. So that may also help you as well, Ms. Sandra. But um, there are where there are small businesses where they can actually apply for grant opportunities as well. So like I said, we'll have a class coming up on that. We do have a past class on that. I'm almost positive, unfortunately, that that class wasn't recorded. And that's just due to the nature of the conversation and because we tried to make sure it was really hands-on. Um, moving to the next one, we have um, Ms. Marilyn West. Um, they said that I received the PPP first. Um, I'm not eligible for the second draw, but I need to understand how to get the first loan forgiven. Um, is this something that um, I can handle actually on my 2020 taxes? And can I put a little um, piece in there as well? Because um, they kind of had a question that I have. Um, I wanted to know, I know you said that the loans were tax deductible. Um, is that going to go, does that refer to the first round as well, or would that just be for the second round? So I wanted to add that onto her existing question. Yeah, so the first question is, how do you take advantage of forgiveness? Uh, remember that at least 60% must be used on payroll and not more than 40% on operating costs. You apply for forgiveness through the banking institution or lender that you receive the loan. You have 10 months at the end of your cover period. So if you uh, have gotten a loan already, your cover period should have been either eight weeks or 24 weeks, depending on when you received it. So at the end of that cover period, you have 10 months to apply for forgiveness through your lending institution. And then uh, your lender has 60 days to review it and make a recommendation to SBA. And the SBA has 90 days to make a decision on if it's going to be forgiven. But remember, 60% uh, on payroll uh, must be uh, in play and then not more than 40% on operating costs. And then the tax deductible uh, portion, uh, so all uh, paycheck protection program loans not already forgiven are tax deductible, uh, 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 is tax deductible for any expenses used for those, with those funds. Can I ask a quick uh, follow-up question to that? Um, can I apply for forgiveness before that um, 10 month period? Or do I need to wait until after, um, you know, my period, which I was a 24 week um, period, can I go ahead and apply even if it's within that time? So you may want to try to wait until the end of your covered period. I mean, you may develop some more expenses, uh, payroll may change. Uh, things like that uh, in the course. Uh, you may have some employees that may quit. I mean, a, a lot of circumstances could happen within that 24 week period. So I would say uh, wait until the end of your 20, your end of your 24 week period uh, to apply. But remember, you have 10 months to apply 
uh, at the end of that period. So you still have a long time to apply uh, before you have to uh, have that application submitted in there. Okay, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And the question about the tax deductible, about the um, it being tax deductible for the first round or is that just gonna be for the second round? We don't hear, you're on mute. Sorry, stuff was popping up on my screen. <laughs> so uh, I'm gonna have to figure out in detail, but I do know going forward that any expenses uh, that are forgivable expenses are tax deductible. Uh, but let me figure out what that is as it relates to uh, PPP loans that have not already been forgiven. Thank you. All right, and I do see your hand is um, raised. Um, I, but we're gonna go through a couple more here in the chat. And here. All right, so we have a question here. Um, and it says, if you were denied by the company and you did receive your first loan, who do you reach out to? If you're de denied by the lending institution and, okay, okay, okay. I think I don't understand because I know, because I, I know this person, so I think I understand their dilemma. So I think they're trying to say that if they did receive the first PPP and then they tried to apply for the second PPP, but they were denied, is there anyone that they can, um, they were denied, I guess, maybe due to a system glitch or error on the application or something of that nature. But if they were denied, um, who, are, who are they able to reach out to or is there any way to rectify that? Yeah, uh, so with the Paycheck Protection Program, if they were denied by the bank, they, they should reach out to that bank and figure out what was the cause of the denial and see if they could try to get that corrected. Uh, but again, they don't have to go with the same lending institution that they used before. They can go through another lending institution. And I'm going to send you that list of banks out here in the DFW area that have committed to offering the Paycheck Protection Program to new clients. But they should definitely reach out to that lender and figure out why they were denied. This is amazing because I know that was one of the hurdles in the first PPP um, is that people didn't have those existing relationships with a lot of the bankers. And so they were kind of, you know, shut out of the... Um, that application process, unfortunately, um, at least the towards at least until the end of it. So that's definitely great that that, that was kind of fixed. Let's see here. We have Miss Linda Todd that says, "Please expand on your thoughts of having a banking relationship. If you have an account open at a bank, is that sufficient, or does a banking advisor need to know you and your business?" Please advise and thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So what we saw during the first couple of rounds of paycheck protection, specifically the first round, is that a lot of people thought they had relationships because they had a banking app on their phone or they had a bank account with that uh, banking institution, but really didn't have that relationship developed and therefore uh, missed out on the first round. Uh, so it's really important to try to have that banking relationship if you can with that institution, uh, working with your, biz your banker, or uh, whoever is in charge of your account, just so you know what type of uh, information is coming out uh, that could uh, potentially affect your business. Um, a lot of the smaller institutions, and that's why we opened it up to a lot of the smaller institutions for this new round, is because we saw that a lot of businesses didn't have those relationships uh, because they had, uh, they had banking accounts with large institutions and it's kind of hard to have a relationship with a large institution because simply they're a large institution. But with some of these smaller institutions, these community development financial institutions like the People Funds, the Lift Funds and the BCL of Texas and others, uh, it's easier for you to have that, pers that interpersonal relationship uh, with those type of uh, institutions. So that's why we open it up uh, firsthand to those type of institutions first. And first of all, make sure that we are targeting uh, those underserved communities that kind of were left out during the first round, uh, which are in underserved communities, uh, minority business owners. We saw a lot of African-American businesses that uh, really didn't get an opportunity to take advantage of this program. Uh, so we open it up to those small institutions. So I encourage you, uh, if you have an issue developing a relationship with a, a large institution, to definitely consider working with one of these community development financial institutions. And again, I can't stress it enough here in Dallas, they are People Fund, Live Fund, and BC out of Texas. And uh, yes, Dan Holmes, y'all have done a lot with those institutions. And uh, you could attest to the relationship building prospect aspect that they have uh, with their clients. 
they are. They're actually they're really amazing. Um, I I will admit to that. I don't know if I've had one with the actual with that last name, the BTL. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. So we had. I don't believe we've um, we've done anything with them just yet. But I can definitely attest to um, people who want to lift fund. They have great um, loan advisors that are looking to help, and they're actually geared and towards helping minority businesses or even minority or people in um, those low operating um, zip codes. So that, that's what they're actually trained for. So we have the next question here. Someone said, can you please repeat the PPP calculations for individuals in the restaurant industry? Um, they said, I believe that it was around, around slide three or two or somewhere around there. Yeah, so for restaurants that are looking for access to a second draw PPP loan, is 3.5 times average monthly payroll costs in either 2019 or 2020 up to $2 million. And because we don't want to tire him out, I'm going to kind of skip around. So if I feel like your question has kind of been answered, um, I may try to modify some or group some together or something like that, because I want to try to see that we can at least touch on a little bit of everything. Um, let's see here. All right, I see your email there, Ms. Sandra. All right, and we have a Mr. Hussein, if I said that right, my apologies if I did not, um, who is a solo entrepreneur. The only healthcare option is through the healthcare exchange. Um, they wanted to know that the SBA actually offer any sort of healthcare, group healthcare. So the SBA does not offer any type of healthcare, but we do promote uh, the small business option program, which is through the healthcare exchange. Thanks, Ahmad. Yeah. So, so when we're going through the healthcare exchange, then I can go in and so that uh, opt for that. Yes, the small business option program or, or, or shop small business health okay. option program. It's a part of the affordable health care, yeah, which is the healthcare exchange program. Okay. Then also, um, Sandra wanted to follow up and ask, was being certified as a woman-owned or minority-owned business help with bank, help with the banks being more open to approving um, your SBA loan? So it's uh, we are targeting these this particular uh, Paycheck Protection Program to make sure that we are hitting those businesses that are in underserved communities like minority veterans and women-owned businesses. Uh, so they are basically getting priority uh, to this round of paycheck protection. Uh, the certification is more for government contracting. So if you're looking to do business with government entities, like get a janitorial contract or a construction contract, those minority certifications are really important for that aspect of business. Um, being minor, We don't have any minorities per se certification on the federal level. We do have federal certifications uh, that minority businesses can take advantage of called the 8A business development uh, uh, program, which is for socially and economically disadvantaged small business owners that are looking to get government contracts with federal agencies. Again, like that janitorial contract, that construction contract, that accounting contract, uh, things like that. And there could be a, a session that we could do later on, Jasmine, where I could talk about the various federal certifications on how businesses can do business with government agencies. So that's very could you repeat that topic um opportunity again for me yeah uh so these are federal certifications to allow businesses to do business with federal agencies uh to get contracting opportunities like construction janitorial so forth and so on I know that was something pre-COVID, that was something that a lot of our clients were interested in and mm -hmm. trying to figure out how to get those federal um contracts so that would be great information. All right, so we have another question here. And it says, how does the SBA help with, from Jasmine, it says, how does the SBA help with building business credit? Um, they said they did get approved for the first PPP loan. However, um, their business credit is not established enough for a loan. Yeah, so again, work with one of those resource partners, either the Small Business Development Center, SCORE, Women's Business Center, or Veterans Business Outreach Center. They are the experts when it comes to business advising and helping you get your business on track. 
And that's another issue that we saw during the first couple of rounds of paycheck protection is that a lot of our businesses just were not prepared when it comes to having uh, financial information in order. So work with those business advisors and let them advise you on what you need to do to get your business, um, uh, in, I guess, in good standing when it comes to credit and financials, either a small business development center score or a women's business center or BBOP. I think we've done some work with SCORE. SCORE is really amazing too. So I can definitely attest to them um, being able to assist and help. Um, let's see here. And so Isla, I see you have your hand raised. So if you wanted to go ahead and ask your question, you have the floor. Oh, certainly. Thank you, Mr. Gorey. Uh, you've certainly unpacked things very nicely. Now, my question is, uh, what was the title? What did you say? Was it stut Stutter Long? for um, like promoters and event holders? Could yes, you know that's that? sure. yeah, so that's the Shuttered Venues Grant. And I'm gonna post the link in the chat so you can access it and see everything about that program. Oh. It's the Shuttered Venues Grant Program. Shuttered, okay. And the, the next question I have, and I'll let someone else speak is, you're using grant and forgivable loan kind of interchangeable. And uh, I'm with a lot of people that um, got grant. Uh, my grandson got a grant because he was a Uber driver at the time. And so the does the grant have to, you can only use it to a certain extent or do you have to apply to be forgiven with the grant? I'm just trying to get clarity on that. Yeah, no problem. So I'm not sure which grant uh, you're referring to that your uh, son got. I know there were a lot of grant opportunities out there for uh, people in the that type of industry, like uh, Uber drivers and Lyft drivers. Uh, so with the the grant that I was mentioning is called the Idle Advance or grant. So that's solely what that is. Is it's a grant. Uh, there is nothing that you have to do to uh, to um, I guess, initiate it, it's, it's automatically a grant. Once you receive it, it's a grant, you don't have to pay it back. So it's nothing that you have to do to uh, oh. apply for forgiveness. But the Paycheck Protection Program, uh, that is a forgivable loan program. So okay. you have to use those proceeds for that purpose in order to get it forgiven. So at least 60% on payroll and not more than 40% on operating costs. And you have to apply for forgiveness and show that you use those funds for those purposes. Uh, to ultimately get it 100% forgivable, forgiven. Okay, yeah, okay, I get it. So the grant, you don't have to do anything. It's, it's just, it's yours. Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. All right, great. And I believe that may have been the last question there. So um, I guess we have um, just a couple more moments. If anyone else had another question, so this is your opportunity. You are more than welcome to um, unmute yourself at this point in time. Look, I know everyone can't um, doesn't know how to make necessarily raise their hand on here. So please feel free. And then if we don't have another question here within the next minute, we'll um, say our goodbyes and our thank you. I have one question about the show. Uh, Grant. About what grant? Yeah, when he mentioned about the- Oh, the shutter grant. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. The shutter venue operators grant. I see that, um, I checked it on the website, um, but they're not accepting applications yet. When do you um, think you're going to possibly start accepting applications for the uh, survey grant? Yeah, we hope in the next couple of weeks. They're still developing the guidelines on how that's going to roll out. So we expect that it will be uh, in the next couple of weeks, and you will apply directly through SBA for that. Uh, but sign up for that email updates, sba.gov forward slash updates. And we're going to be sending out information about those, uh, about when that happens, when it's going to open up. Or you can follow that local Twitter page at SBA DFW. Thank you for that. We definitely appreciate it. Uh, and that's Grant, that is for the United States, or is that just going, that's not specific to the Dallas area, is it? Because I know we have some people that are on here from other areas as well. Yeah, that's a federal program. So any business that's located within the United States and its territories uh, can take advantage of it. So I get, um, is there anyone else? Going once, going twice. 
All right. Uh, and we do also, like I said, we see have a couple of people here in the chat that did say send their thank yous, uh, um, as well as our board chair, Ms. Demetra Sampson. So thank you for being here with us. Um, and she wanted to express um, our gratitude for you bringing us this very timely information as she says it in the chat. Um, again, like I said, I keep saying thank you, but um, truly this is definitely an on-time message that a lot of people needed to have. We do have this recorded. So for those that weren't able to join us, we do encourage for um, our participants to please share this information with other people. Um, it will be on our YouTube channel as well as our Facebook page. So they'll be able to go and obtain it there for us as well. If people have any other questions um, in the future, because a lot of times they're, they're taking in this information, but as they kind of go through the process, you gave them a lot of resources to reach out to, but is there anyone inside the SBA or a good contact um, with the SBA that people outside of just maybe, I guess, that 1-800 number, if it's, if that's the only one that understood, but is there any other additional resources that may be available for those that need to speak with someone at the SBA as they're going through this process? Yeah, our uh, office is always open to answer any questions. Uh, and I've just posted the number in the chat. It's 817-684-5500. Uh, just call that number if you have any questions about any of the SBA's programs. Uh, definitely uh, give us a call and we will uh, try our best to, to get that answer for you. Um, and so with, um, without further ado, I want to also um, encourage you all, like I said, um, for those that have been affected by COVID, which I'm assuming a lot of us have been, especially here um, receiving this information, if you are in need of trying to receive any type of glasses or you need that eye exam, anything that just kind of helps them um, the burden or the lower some of the expenses inside of your current home. Um, when it comes to, like I said, that eye care, please um, join us on February the 4th. Um, we have some great information for you then. Like I said, we have some great classes coming up. We're going to definitely get Mr. Ahmad back or someone from his team back to speak with us about those federal grants moving forward here as we get over this um, COVID hump, um, as well as we have some grant writing classes coming um, we're going to do some more social media marketing classes. We have some sales classes, um, accounting classes, because like I said, a, there are definitely a lot of questions around accounting. Um, I think this did help illuminate to a lot of us that operate inside of small, small businesses what we don't have. Um, like you said, there's a lot of things that we were kind of doing and figuring out, and we need to make sure that we um, do a better job of keeping the keeping those reports and um make sure we're notating and make sure we're doing things properly. So that way we can include ourselves inside the process when they do have opportunities like these from the SBA. Um, Cause I do think that was another reason why a lot of us were actually, um, you know, eliminated from the process is because we didn't have the proper documentation that they were asking for to show that our businesses were legitimate. Um, so we're definitely going to, um, like I said, have a, an accounting class and we're going to try to do everything that we can on our end to help legitimize um, and then um, lastly, we also have um, In Conversation um, that is coming up. If you go to our website, I'm going to drop that in the chat. But if you go to our website, you'll see where we have In Conversation. That is our largest fundraiser of the year. So everything that we do at the center is free of charge. Uh, we try to provide this information and resources to you all completely free of charge. Um, but of course, we do appreciate when anyone is willing to um, help donate or even volunteer. Um, if you were interested in participating or joining in conversation, I do not have that date in front of me. I'm going to go to the website real quick here if y'all don't mind. Because I don't want to give you all any wrong information. March 5. Thank you. So it's on March the 5th. Um, and it's going to be with a Mr. Dale Hansen, um, as well as I believe um, Dr. Um, Reverend Zan Wesley Holmes Jr. will also be um, joining us hopefully as well on March the 5th, we would love for you to come hear what they have to say about the community and us moving and progressing forward. And then if you um, feel the um, feeling on your heart to donate, we definitely appreciate that. Um, without anything else, again, thank you all. We're gonna go ahead and close this out. I will send out a follow-up email to everyone that was um, to everyone that registered. So if you did not register for the event, and I'm talking this particular event, because we did have to close this event because we had so many people that registered. So if you didn't, if you registered for this event, then you will receive a follow-up email from me um, that will include all of the different links that he provided for us here today. Um, if you did not register for this event and more than likely you received your um, link to get in today from someone else, even myself, because I'm moving fast, I didn't get a chance to record your names. 
So you would have to email me and let me know that you want to receive that information. I will put my email in the email, in the email box below. Please email me. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and just give you the info one. But again, anyone that did register for the event and you received this link via email, you will receive that follow-up email with the links that he provided for us today. Otherwise, please email me so that way I can make sure that you receive that information as well. Um, and anyone that registered for February the 4th, which is our low vision class, you will receive a you will receive the Zoom link for that class. I think a lot of people did in error register for that class thinking that we're registering for this one. Um, so you have already been added to that one. So if you did not intend to join that one, um, there's no need to email me, just disregard the email when you receive it. Um, I see a Miss Denise, we were about to close out, but did you have a question, Miss Denise? Uh, yeah, it was answered already. Um, okay. I just wanted to know what type of businesses can serve um, the, the federal government. I, I know you say construction businesses and um, restaurant businesses, I believe. And what else did you say? Construct oh, uh, cleaning services. So I was just wondering what other type of businesses could provide services to the federal government? Yeah, so the federal government is the largest purchasing entity in the entire world. We spend about $500 billion a year in purchasing things and that's just about anything. So just about any business. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. All right, and we'll definitely, uh, we'll get you, we'll add it to our email list, ma'am. Um, so that way, when we do have Mr. Amaya back with us to speak about that, we'll be, we'll love to have you. But again, thank you all. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording here. Again, this will be on our YouTube channel. So please share this with 